Great, thanks so much. Welcome everyone to uh, this year's um, ABPN Continuing Certification Information Webinar. Uh, so this, this is uh, gonna be a great opportunity to um, allow you to um, learn the basics of how continuing certification work uh, via the ABPN, what resources are available from the American Academy of Neurology to help you with that, and then to ask questions about this. So we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions and discussions, and we'll also be sure you leave this well-equipped uh, well to answer questions that you might have that aren't addressed today. So again, today's focus is on continuing certification requirements via the ABPN, previously known as maintenance of certification. Uh, and this is gonna include a good discussion about the new article-based continuing certification pathway. And judging from the questions that were uh, sent ahead of time, I think you'll find this very informative and helpful. Uh, I'll go over the AAN's portfolio of lifelong learning resources and highlight those that will help uh, diplomates meet the requirements of the ABPN, and then we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions. Next slide. I think going into this, it's a bit of an alphabet soup of different organizations, and it's helpful for folks to understand uh, which organization is which and what they uh, what their primary vision and objectives are. And so, uh, continuing certification as a um, as an entity per se is something that's really mandated by the American Board of Medical Specialties. So the ABMS oversees a, a large number of member uh, specialty boards, of which the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology is one. So uh, continuing certification is a program via the ABMS that the ABPN has to execute and comply with, and we'll hear about how they're doing that right now or in a moment. Uh, there's a separate entity or a separate uh, process called maintenance of licensure, which is important, of course, in maintaining your license. There are aspects of the work that you do for continuing certification that may do double duty for your maintenance of licensure, but maintenance of licensure is mandated by the Federation of State Medical Boards. And all the organizations I've talked about so far are, are really public facing uh, entities that are here to ensure that all of us as uh, citizens, as consumers of healthcare, uh, can have good con confidence in the, the quality and safety of the care we're receiving. Um, the American Academy of Neurology is, uh, is a uh, member organization for neurologists, neuroscientists, students, and others. Uh, we are um, not so much a public-facing uh, entity as we are a, a specialty-facing entity. Obviously, you know, our vision is to be indispensable to our members, and what um, I'll be talking about are the lifelong learning resources that we've developed to be indispensable to you in meeting your continuing certification needs. So if we go to the next slide, um, um, I'm Gordon Smith, so uh, you've already uh, met me, and it gives me uh, immense pleasure to introduce you to Clay Goodman, who is um, a neurologist, neuropathologist at, at Baylor. He's vice chair of the uh, board of directors, the ABPN. Uh, he's here representing the ABPN and talking to us about the continuing certification program, uh, but he's one of us. He's a, a card-carrying a neurologist and, a, and an overall great guy. So Clay, I'm gonna hand it off to you to talk, talk about the ABPN Continuing Certification Program. Thank you, Gordon, I really appreciate it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I, I do wanna uh, pause just a moment to acknowledge how we've responded to COVID. Uh, our office actually closed uh, last Mar uh, March of uh, last year. Our staff are working from home. Uh, I'll give you some contact information a little later uh, so that uh, you can contact them and they will respond uh, promptly. We're using email as our primary conduit. But the most important piece of information I have for you is that we've pushed deadlines into 2022. So if you had certification uh, uh, renewals for 2020 or 2021, those deadlines are now into 2022, December of 2022. And we're gonna make it as uh, straightforward as possible uh, for you to take advantage of this. The other implication of this is that you will be eligible for entry into the article-based uh, continuing certification 
really uh, no matter what in 2022. We will talk a little bit more about specifics, but there are gonna be opportunities. Next slide, please. Now I do wanna go over the general characteristic. As Gordon pointed out, we, uh, the boards, all the 24 member boards uh, do have to comply with ABMS standards, uh, which have to balance quality and credibility, convenience and cost, and ultimately diplomat satisfaction and participation. These standards often will meet also your licensure requirements. Uh, and they also contain components which have been identified as important by organizations that credential physicians. Next slide, please. Now, here's the basics, okay. Uh, in to, uh, in 2012, uh, continuing certification really came online and in its present form. As uh, Gordon pointed out, we've changed the name from MOC to CC. Uh, MOC had become in some ways such a toxic uh, brand. Uh, critics will, of course, and partially rightfully say we're just pouring old wine into new bottles by changing the name. But I think you'll see that uh, especially the article-based uh, program is very new and will be very beneficial. So what do you have to do to maintain your certification, continuing certification? One, unrestricted medical license. Two, patient safety activity. This is a one-time deal and chances are every single one of you has done this. Um, previously, you had only one choice of the 10-year cognitive exam, the secure cognitive exam. Um, and uh, now, starting in 2022, article-based continuing certification will kick online. Uh, you do have to meet additional educational requirements which include CME, a total of 90 hours of CME, of which 24 hours have to be self-assessment CME, and one PIP activity. Um, annual attestation is given to the folio, the ABPN folio. Uh, so you basically attest to these uh, uh, that you've done so much CME, so many hours of CME SA, uh, and only a small fraction of diplomats are ever audited, at which time you would need to produce uh, proof uh, of these. And I'll say a little bit more about Neurotracker in a few minutes as a, as a great way to keep, store your stuff. The annual fee is $175. The, cog the, the exam, the secure exam, or the ABCC, article-based continuing certification, incurs no additional fee. Okay, next slide, please. I'm gonna drill down a little bit. Um, unrestricted medical license. One of the fastest ways you can get into trouble with your certification is to lose your license. If your license is restricted or revoked, you are immediately no longer board certified. Uh, and there's a national database uh, called DANS, which uh, provides institutions, including ABPN, with information about uh, the status of uh, individual physicians uh, certification. So for goodness sakes, don't get into trouble with your state medical board. Don't get behind. Uh, and we've tracked uh, diplomats that got into trouble. And it won, for the most part, it wasn't trivial trouble. It was Medicare fraud, boundary violations. There are some somewhat simpler issues. But the bottom line is, keep your state license clean, up to date, and uh, pristine. Next. Lifelong learning self-assessment, CME and SA. A very large number of AAN 
educational products fulfill these requirements and Gordon will be going into these in more detail. You can uh, store information. If you get your credit from AAN, it's already in NeuroTracker. But even if you have external uh, documents, you can store them in NeuroTracker. It is also possible to store it in our folio, although our folio is actually currently somewhat more clumsy than NeuroTracker. And as I've already mentioned, uh, 90 CME credits are required for every three years. Your certification, your 10-year certification is really divided up into three three-year cycles. Uh, and we expect you to attain uh, a certain amount of CME per cycle uh, and uh, make your way through the 10-year cycle um, uh, in these three cycles. Now, uh, SA, self-assessment, provides uh, not only CME, but you get uh, feedback. You see how you compare with other physicians. Most people think this is a more it's a superior form of lifelong learning. And as I've mentioned, patient safety is a one-time lifetime deal. If you've ever had a patient safety course, you've passed this. Next slide, please. And uh, some people have asked us, can we waive a certain amount of the uh, CME, the self-assessment CME, and it is possible. Uh, if you've uh, got a peer-reviewed grant accepted, a peer-reviewed paper, uh, uh, et cetera, participation in the registry, in the Axon registry, uh, and uh, participation in the pilot project, which I'll go up into a little more detail in a moment, the pilot project has run from uh, 2019 to 2021 and is the precursor of the article-based uh, continuing certification program. So you can get a certain amount of credit for stuff you're doing. Next, please. And I've already mentioned this. It's a lifetime requirement for patient safety, any patient safety. Uh, so chances are you've already fulfilled this. Next slide. Okay, now the, the exam. This was a secure, proctored, practice-relevant exam. It's developed by your peers. They're administered internationally, actually, at Pearson View. Uh, and I want to be very clear. You do have to uh, complete all the other continuing certification requirements, all the CME, uh, all the CMESA, uh, keeping your license clean. Uh, and during the time we've been giving the exam, the pass rate has been high in the range of 97 to 99 percent. Um, and many uh, neurologists and psychiatrists have found this, however, to be a stressful situation that may take time away from their practice as they study up. Others prefer it. So the exam is not going away. There may be some people who choose to take the exam and not participate in article-based continuing certification. The new kid on the block though is article-based continuing certification, which is a way to avoid having to take the secure proctored exam. Again, it does not substitute for the CME or self-assessment or PIP. Uh, so, so you can either do the secure exam or you can do article-based. Next slide, please. Uh, PIP, I know we had a few questions on this and the uh, among those you sent, we'll be posting an FAQ on this. Uh, it's really easier than it seems uh, to maintain. If you're, for example, on a stroke team at a hospital, you've satisfied your PIP requirements. And you would tell us, I'm on a stroke team. And in the unlikely event you were audited, your institution would then provide us with, yeah, we've got a stroke team and Dr. Goodman participates. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so 
now I'm going to get back to the article based stuff. And we've been running a pilot project. We had to get approval from the American Board of Medical Specialties to do this. So we couldn't just arbitrarily start it. Um, but this has been running since 2019 now. And people who could recertify under the pilot uh, were people who uh, uh, were in psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, neurology, and child neurology. The subspecialties will come online in 2022 when we transition to the permanent article-based continuing certification program. Again, you do have to continue to meet all of the CME, CME, SA, PIP requirements. Um, and the actual operation of this, and I'll show you some concrete examples in a moment, is you're provided a menu of articles. Uh, you read an article and you answer five multiple choice questions on uh, 30 out of 40 uh, journal articles. It is online open book. So you can have the article in front of you as you take the exam. Uh, you have to answer four out of five questions correctly and you get only one shot. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the, an, an example of how I got into trouble one weekend in November, probably after having uh, a couple of uh, glasses of wine, I said, well, heck, I'm going to do some of these darned articles. And uh, four out of five is hard especially uh, uh, if you have only a fuzzy recollection of what happened in the article, but it's open book to really do it right. The next time I do it, I'm gonna uh, have the article right there in front of me. Some people have asked, how can this be incorporated into departmental learning? You can have a journal club. You can, you can have your, your members read these articles. They have to exam take the exam individually and a test, they've done them individually. Um, but you can leverage uh, the advantage of these. Uh, and you'll get credit if you receive, uh, if you read uh, and successfully pass 30 articles, uh, you'll be excused from the exam in this particular cycle. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, some of you ask in the uh, questions you sent in is where, where the heck is there information about this? And on the ABPN website, uh, there is a, a, a whole section with, with some detailed information about uh, the pilot project. It's still called the pilot project. We can't call it uh, the permanent solution until 2022, but uh, American Board of Medical Specialties has approved it as a permanent solution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and just to give you a, a quick idea, a snapshot uh, of the people that were eligible to enter the pilot project, um, among neurologists, there were about 5,000 people, uh, 4,000 enrolled, uh, and they're working their way to completion. They don't have to get to completion until the end of the year. Next slide, please. Uh, the people who have participated said the articles are easy to access. They're helpful. They're clinically relevant to their practice. They're helpful to practice. Uh, the test was a fair assessment. Questions were well written. Uh, we, we actually have uh, fixed some of the questions on the fly if people who take the uh, uh, exam uh, have uh, challenge uh, some of the questions. And uh, their experience has been satisfactory, 91%, which is uh, really uh, quite extraordinary. Next slide, please. Okay, in 2022, the article-based continuing certification pathway opens. It continues to incorporate psychiatry, neurology, child neurology, child and adolescent psychiatry, but also in 20, starting in 2022, will cover the subspecialties. So you'll be able to do article-based uh, 
uh, continuing certification for both the primary as well as the subspecialty uh, subspecialties of psychiatry and neurology. And that's why that 2022 deadline uh, thing was important in terms of our response to COVID. This gives you opportunities to enter the article-based continuing certification pathway in 2022. We are currently writing tests, our test writing committees are, 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 are providing information. We'll be ready to go. Now, neurocritical care is our most recent uh, subspecialty. It uh, actually will not be, there won't be anybody eligible to take this in 2022, but it'll come online in due course. Next slide, please. And it's uh, the, the overall design of the permanent solution, the ABCC design, is you will have a menu of articles. The articles are divided up into content areas, and you have to choose uh, four to six articles from what each content category. So you're not going to find uh, under uh, movement disorders uh, 30 articles on DBS. You may have six articles on DBS, and you choose four of them. Um, you have to answer four out of five on the first attempt. Uh, and in the event we use an article uh, in both the primary certification as well as subspecialty, we'll make sure the questions are different uh, in those two exams. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some samples. This was from my own uh, experience. Uh, here was a neuromuscular disease. Here are the sample article titles. Uh, these, as you can see, are very clinical. You will not see anything on uh, mutant sodium channels in the eye of a newt, okay? These are clinical. Uh, and uh, many of our uh, people who are participating have said they're, they're, they're not only clinical, they're relevant uh, and uh, to practice. Next slide. Okay, and here's my abysmal performance uh, last November. Uh, I passed four out of the, I've now passed four out of the 30 exams. I have until December of 2022 to finish them all up. Uh, and I screwed up on a couple. Antibiotic associated encephalopathy, which for the inpatient consult service is important. And I just screwed up on the autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, and so I, I didn't get 80 out of 100. These others, brain death, treatment of brain mets, uh, CTE, uh, I managed to squeak by. Next slide, please. So we'll be transitioning from the pilot. Those of you who have participated in the pilot, uh, everything you've done counts. Uh, so you'll retain credit for article assessments completed during the pilot project. Um, and they'll be applied to the first full block of the ABCC. Next slide, please. Um, if your uh, certificates are expiring, uh, in as I've mentioned in 2020 or 2021, 20, your uh, deadline has been extended through 2022. Next slide, please. Um, now, what about a person who has multiple certificates? Um, if you take, if you want to do continuing uh, uh, certification in only one area, it's thirty articles. If you have other uh, certificates you want to maintain. Uh, the bar is lowered to 20 articles. So if you're neurology plus vascular neurology, you'd read a total of 50 articles, 30 plus 20. Uh, and then it increments basically by 20 uh, for every additional certificate. And a few people do have uh, uh, three or four certificates. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we have built in some uh, mercy as far as the number of uh, uh, articles, articles required. 
Next slide. Now, this is really darned complicated. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. Every person is an individual. Your pathways are individualized. Uh, and we at the ABPN will be communicating with you with individual personalized requirements. And by the end of this year, our, uh, uh, we will have a, a dashboard available to you. As you could see right now, you can look, go in and look and say, oh, you're, you've done 40 articles. You need uh, 26 more. Uh, but we'll have a dashboard. Our IT people are working very hard on making this more attractive. I'm sure we'll be talking with AAN about uh, uh, communication between Neurotracker and our system. Currently, Neurotracker pumps information over to our system on CME and CMESA. The most important line in my entire presentation is this email address questions at abpn.com. Um, we know it's individual and you will have individual questions. And for goodness sakes, don't walk up to a director and say, hey, this is my situation, what do I do? Because we may or may not give you the correct answer. We'll probably give you something close, but the people who can really give you the right answers are our staff. And, uh, and if you write questions to abpn.com, and just, uh, uh, next slide, please. Questions at abpn.com, you'll get an email back soon. We have found that actually email works better because both you and we have a record of the interaction. Uh, and our staff knows all about this, the complexities. Uh, there will be times of confusion. Reach out to us because we want to answer your questions. I know that was a whirlwind trip, uh, but I hope you uh, have a better understanding of what's available, what's coming. And... Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Gordon. Uh, thanks, Clay. Who knew it could be so complicating, but uh, complicated? But I think um, it's complicated because it's uh, it's evolving, and I actually think improving over time. So that was a great overview, and we're already getting already getting a lot of questions, and we'll get into those in a few moments. But first, I'm going to spend some time going over the Academy's lifelong learning resources and. In doing so, I'm going to cover our live conferences, e-learning tools, uh, print or enduring. Um, I think our e-learning people would probably argue e-learning can be enduring too. Uh, PIP and non-CMA self-assessment resources, the neuro tracker, and then resources for the ABPN pilot. So getting into conferences, uh, great, great time to be talking about that. You'll notice that my background looks very similar to this slide. The, uh, uh, 2021 virtual annual meeting is uh, starting on April 17th, so very exciting. Um, this uh, is uh, going to be a really great experience, and I hope all of you are going to participate um, as a shameless plug. It's got fantastic educational tools that will serve your continuing certification needs, but also uh, opportunities for networking and entertainment. Um, we're actually using a um, platform software called Keens that's really fantastic. Those of us who are on the meeting management committee got a real life tour of this uh, just on Friday, and I, I think you're really going to like it. Uh, it's been optimized, the meeting's been optimized for a virtual uh, uh, format, so the courses are shorter, the overall length of the meeting is shorter, and obviously there's plenty of CME to be had. Um, we also have regional conferences, as you're well aware. Uh, so the Sports Concussion Conference uh, will take place virtually in July. Uh, we uh, had developed an advanced practice provider conference that was to have taken place live last year, but our amazing Academy staff were very nimble and shifted into a virtual 10-week online series. And so for 2021, this will be available 10 weeks, August to October. Uh, I can also tell you that we're hiring APPs in my department at a very steady pace, and we have all of them participate in these resources, which they find very valuable. And then, of course, the 2021 Fall Conference. Uh, we're not 
uh, quite sure what this is going to look like in 2021. It was a virtual conference that was very successful in 2020. So more to come on that soon, I hope. So in terms of e-learning platform, we have a number of different products available. One that has been extremely popular and, and directly serves the self-assessment requirements uh, is NeuroSAE, Neuro Self-Assessment. Uh, so there are general neurology editions. There's a vascular neurology edition. Uh, these uh, have eight credits of uh, self-assessment self CME. Uh, for the 2019 annual meeting, there was an annual meeting uh, self-assessment. This actually had 10 self-assessment CME credits. Uh, and we have a suite of products called NeuroReady. Uh, and the one that's relevant here is NeuroReady Continuing Certification Edition. And so this is a continuing certification preparation course uh, that's really fantastic. I took the earlier version of this and what I'm pleased to say will be my last ever high stakes examination if I understand what Clay told me. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely going all in with the article-based continuing certification. Uh, so this prep course includes a syllabi with 14 topics with audio interviews of the faculty members and then a 100 question multiple choice question self-assessment exam that comes with 15 self-assessment credits. Um, I, you know, I actually really enjoyed taking mine and um, I, I think it's something I wouldn't mind doing periodically independent of the article based uh, uh, continuing certification program. And I think you would find this uh, a great educational uh, experience. Of course, uh, the annual meeting um, has come with a uh, e-learning uh, component, which is called annual meeting on demand. Uh, this, I would say, had a, um, a reasonably sized and very dedicated uh, constituency prior to last year. Uh, but last year, given the pandemic, uh, we were able to really use this to serve uh, all of our members' needs. And I want to acknowledge that this was made possible by a very generous grant from the ABPN. So annual meeting from 2019 on demand was made available to all of our members and all ABPN diplomates. Uh, and we're continuing to provide annual meeting on demand in uh, 2021. So this will include 164 sessions including 119 courses, 32 scientific sessions, six neuroscience in the clinic sessions, and seven plenary sessions. And, um, and uh, I, I would say there's been a lot of interest this year, given that we're all now experts in e-learning and e-learning platforms. Uh, so of the um, uh, core uh, e-learning tools that we have on our website, uh, the longer format tool is called NeuroLearn. Uh, these courses are, are longer, so they're 30 minutes to an hour plus. They're module-based, self-paced. Uh, they're really clinical topics and practice topics, and you can see the active modules on the left. So introduction, introduction to telemedicine, telemedicine barriers lifted during COVID-19, plexus. Uh, I'll talk about patient safety in, in a moment and others. Uh, here's the patient safety module. This NeuroLearn course was designed specifically to meet the ABPN patient safety uh, requirement that uh, Dr. Goodman talked about. And uh, this was developed uh, in a collaboration between the A and education committee, so people who understood about pedagogy and education, and our medical economics and practice committee, uh, where the knowledge regarding patient safety resides. And so it was a really great collaborative course. It covers 10 topics for uh, self-assessment CME credits, and it's been approved for the ABPN, both for the patient safety self-assessment as well as self-assessment CME. I've also taken this and found it uh, really informative, and I think you would enjoy it as well. And if you uh, uh, have a need to complete a patient safety module, you haven't done it through your own institution or practice, this is a great, uh, a great tool for you. Um, there are also practice management webinars uh, available, and these are developed by the AAN Medical Economics and Practice Committee. They include hot topics in practice. They're both live and recorded and are offered generally quarterly. Uh, there's a new product available uh, in the e-learning space over the last year. This started uh, in uh, almost exactly a year ago called the Question of the Day. So this is free to Academy members. Uh, apropos of the name, there's one new uh, multiple choice question every day. 
uh, we have a separate track for medical students, which is really meant to engage, educate our uh, student colleagues. And the content's based on the ABPN continuing service or continuing certification content outline. Uh, Self-assessment with rationale and resources for further study are included. Uh, and this is fully gamifiable. There are score reports and peer comparisons available. There are two self-assessment CME credits for every 25 question answered for a maximum total of 29 self-assessment CMEs per year. So easy to rack up the CME and the self-assessment CME with question of the day. Uh, and this uh, product really is uh, full service, push notification. I've already talked about the gamification leaderboard. You can compete as a team and there's even a mentor chat. So check it out. It's really quite, quite a, a great, uh, great tool. Um, enduring and print CME opportunities. So um, Continuum, I, I think of as being a flagship uh, neurology education tool. Um, I'm biased perhaps, but it's really fantastic. If you subscribe to Continuum, you get both Continuum, the journal, as well as Continuum audio. Uh, these are topic-based, uh, obviously print, online, and audio. Uh, each Continuum comes with 20 self-assessment CME credits and each audio uh, version with a quarter hour to an hour of CME uh, credit. And, and the continuums offer everything you need to know to maintain kind of competence and the knowledge base around the specific topic here we see neurocritical care on the slide. Uh, obviously, there's CME available through other journals, including the uh, main journal, Neurology, as well as the Neurology Podcast. So I'd encourage you to check those out. The podcast has been growing in popularity and is a very I would say, pleasant way of uh, engaging in this material in a, a different format. So what about PIP clinical and non-CME self-assessments? So there's the Axon Registry, which I think Clay mentioned, and uh, this is a really exciting um, product tool resource that was developed by the American Academy of Neurology and represents a major investment in our field and is actually transformative in so many ways. One of those ways is it uh, does fulfill uh, the uh, criteria for PIP for those who participate in it. Uh, the Axon Registry is really intended at its core to improve patient care and outcomes and help you in your efforts to provide patient care uh, excellence and outcomes. It meets federal reporting and board certification requirements. And uh, at the same time, it allows us as a specialty to demonstrate our value as neurologists and the discussions that happen between academy leadership and uh, federal regulata regulators and, and policy stakeholders. It's a free member benefit. And so this is a really great opportunity. Increasingly academic institutions are beginning to engage and uh, there's a lot more than one can uh, you know, uh, talk about regarding the Axon Registry, but most important for our conversation today, it's approved by the ABPN for non-CME self-assessment and PIP credit. So what about tracking uh, your, uh, your CME? I've, I've, uh, I've not been audited by the ABPN, although I probably just guaranteed that'll happen now. I see Clay writing my name down there. I have been audited by my state medical board and uh, I wasn't so organized. So it was a bit of a goat rodeo pulling things together. Uh, the NeuroTracker is intended to help you keep track of lots of things, but for our purposes here, uh, your CME, self-assessment, PIP, as well as academy involvement. And so anything you do with the AAN, whether it's uh, serve as a member of a committee or subcommittee, CME you obtain through any of the various tools that I've uh, listed so far, will automatically be kept in NeuroTracker. And this uh, data can transfer directly to the ABPN um, for you, if that's what you wish for continuing certification. Uh, now, the NeuroTracker can also be used for you to house your non-academy CME documentation. Uh, these documents don't automatically go over to the ABPN, but if you were to be audited, the ABPN will already have all of your academy stuff, and you can use NeuroTracker to rapidly access the rest of your CME documentation for that audit. This also allows you to work on your CV and things like that. So uh, resources for the ABPN article-based continuing certification program. Uh, so obviously the publications, and I've already um, talked about how great Continuum is, and, and you can see the other neurology journals, which are equally fantastic, neurology, neurology clinical practice, uh, neurology, uh, neuroinflammation, and genetics. 
Uh, and this is a final uh, slide that just summarizes the resources provided by the AAN across the, the differing continuing certification uh, components, part two, part two self-assessment, and then uh, part four with the Axon registry. And this is all available on our website. And as I mentioned, we'll uh, release the slides. So I think that's the end of the formal portion here of the, um, of the slides. And so at this point, um, I'd like to, you know, we've been open for questions and uh, I've got some that I wanna ask Clay and um, I'm happy to answer questions uh, about the Academy um, products. So I think a couple of framing uh, comments as we get ready to, to um, uh, ask Dr. Goodman some questions. I think the first is uh, we're really gonna focus on questions in this venue that apply to more than one person. Um, I, I, our experience having done a ton of these over the years, Clay, I think you would agree that a lot of the questions we get are very specific and some of them kind of challenging. And so we're keeping track of these in the chat and we're gonna encourage you to follow up with the ABPN regarding very specific questions. Um, and really what we want to do now is focus on questions that have broader uh, impact. And I, I'm going to start off with one that um, I think will, will um, um, resonate with some of the other ones I'm seeing. And that is, when, when's the last high stakes exam going to happen that we have to take? Who's the, who's the last guy shot in the war here, Clay? Because the dates get a little bit confusing here. So, uh, you know, what, when, when's the last time anyone's going to be required to take their high stakes exam? Uh that's an excellent question and kind of a complicated question. Uh, but our goal is to not have anybody have to take the high stakes exam. Uh, and now with the pushback of deadlines to 2022, uh, it is our ambition uh, that nobody will have to take the high, high stakes exam and we'll be able to switch over to the um, um, article-based system. Now, that said, uh, some people want to take the high stakes exam. They say, I don't want to screw with all these articles. You know, I, I do the 10 year thing. We're going to keep the, the high stakes exam available. And uh, for those people who like to do stuff that way, uh, we, we don't agree with that approach as a lifelong learning approach, but we do uh, respect the, the diplomats. The other, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, someone asked, okay, so, so what if I'm in the article base thing and I just get sick of it? Or uh, I'm like Dr. Goodman and fail exams. Uh, is the high stakes exam a backup? And that is absolutely true. So if for, for whatever reason, you were not able to successfully complete the article-based continuing certification, then it would default uh, to the uh, high stakes proctored exam. Uh, great, so Clay, I think there's, all, I sense there's some confusion still about the pivot from the high stakes exam to the article-based continuing certification. Can you talk uh, about that so that um, folks will know when, when are they gonna enter this? Okay, so I, I and, and Patty is actually on the line too, uh, or she's available to, to, to respond. Um, since every person is, an, is individualized, you will be receiving communications from ABPN over the course of the next few months uh, about your status, where you are, where you stand, what do you need to do to pivot? Now, I understand that there may be some people that are uh, creeping up to being so darn close that they're, they're, they're worried about it. And, and that's fair. And I would say for that, for your individual situation, please, please send an email to Patty. Um, and uh, Patty just sent me a note. The enrollment options will be sent to the diplomats. Uh, and she says, stay tuned. Uh, that's great. And so here's another one that um, was just submitted and I think um, captures a number of other questions. 
um, how will this work for subspecialties? So you talked a little bit about the article-based expectations for people who might have one, two, three subspecialties. Uh, what about CME requirements? So if I've got uh, clinical neurophysiology, neuromuscular, my core certificate, how many hours of CME do I need each three-year cycle? It's uh, the amount of CME is the same, the fixed so that, amount. So 30 or uh, 30 for each or just 30? Oh, oh, you're talking articles or CME? I'm sorry. CME hours. So if I, if I have three, um, three certificates, of ABN, yeah. do I need three times as many hours if I only had one? Or do I, can I just do the 30 across all three or somewhere in the middle? Okay. I'm having a little inter uh, trouble. Inter okay. CME doesn't increment. So CME you do is good. The 90 required is 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 good. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I said the wrong number. I apologize. I've got uh, articles on the brain. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, so meant, I meant I was saying for the year, but the three years. So that's the point. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. accumulate across your oh yeah yeah no no you're you're the the CME and the CME SA uh, covers all your certificates. Now the articles as I indicated for the first certificate um, the uh, uh, is 30 articles. For every subsequent certificate, it's an additional 20 articles. Okay, so, you know, the example, well, you've got your primary certification in neurology and neuromuscular. Uh, so you'd do 30 and 20 articles. Does that make sense? Yep. So I, it was an easy question, and I, I made it harder by using bad That's math. That's okay. That's okay. And, uh, you know, and we're all in this together. It's complicated. Uh, and if you, if you feel uh, uh, confused, uh, you're not alone. Uh, but we're going to make it as smooth as we can. We're going to make it as individualized as we can. Um, do you have any other themes i think a couple of themes are uh, what about sleep medicine and then uh, palliative care i mean both of these uh, i believe are uh, administratively um, housed out of the abim so what, what do we tell our sleep medicine colleagues and palliative care colleagues okay uh no th those are great questions uh and neither one will be added to the abcc pathway because the administrative boards are medicine our board is medicine and so uh, but they have a longitudinal pathway uh, for sleep medicine now that does mean for the sleep medicine person that you'll maintain your neurology certification in our system and your sleep medicine certification in in internal medicine now some of you are probably aware that medicine, internal medicine, has dropped their requirement that people maintain primary certification. And so there are people who are sleep medicine certified. The administrative board is internal medicine. Uh, and uh, we at the ABPN made the decision that uh, maintenance of the primary certification depends on the administrative board. So if an individual wanted to, we don't recommend it, but if they wanted to drop their neurology certification and ju maintain just sleep, they could do that. Because we also had the uh, uh, unfortunate situation that in a same sleep lab, you'd have a neurologist who was maintaining primary certification in neurology and an internist who didn't have to do that. And so the, the board made the decision that the administrative board uh, controls uh, who has to maintain their uh, uh, primary certification. So Clay, there's a great question here that just came in in the chat. And uh, this is a way of my reminding people, um, we're not actually monitoring the chat, but I just happened to see it. So if you have a question, please put it in the question and answer because this 
means we see it. It also means uh, ABPN and Academy staff are monitoring that. And so they're an answering those in the background. But this question is, do you have to be the first author on a peer reviewed paper to have it count towards SAE? And uh, I write grants and uh, I guess, does my grant have to be funded, scored or you know, critiqued? What are the rules governing using an article or a grant for a self-assessment? You know, I told you not to ask a board member these specific questions, um, but Patty is uh, in the background. Uh, first authorship is not required, it has to be a peer reviewed paper. The grants, I honestly don't remember. I, I think they just have to be reviewed. Yeah. And the papers have to be indexed on Medline. They have to be indexed on Medline. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is how we know Clay's honest because um, someone who is less forthright would just wait for the, the, the voice in his ear to whisper the answer, so. Um, no, I love this, you know, Patty is <laughs> keeping me as honest as she can. Um, now there was and, a- and, and for the grant, and she just wrote me, now, the, some of them are approved, but not always funded. So, <laughs> and that's a little tricky. So that to me would be if um, you're planning on using your scored but unfunded grant uh, for self-assessment, probably best to check with the ADP. Check with the office. Yeah. Absolutely check with the office. Yeah. Um, so there was a question about the patient safety course. Is that something typically done in the hospital setting as part of the annual courses that institutions mandate? Um, the, the, the resource I was uh, sharing is obviously available by the uh, on the A and website for A and members, but Clay, maybe just to go back and tell us uh, about the patient safety requirement. How do most people access this? And uh, is it true we only need this once? Yeah, A, it's true. It's a lifetime deal, uh, and uh, any institution's patient safety course. So if you took a patient safety course as a resident, or if it's part of your annual portfolio of uh, courses you have to take, that'll count. Yeah. Now, uh, if you were ever audited, you know, it'd be nice to have a copy of the certificate. Uh, it'd be easier on you, but uh, it's any patient safety course uh, by any institution. Uh, and, and of course, the AA and, and, uh, and, you know, you would need to, if you were audited, you would need to provide proof. Yeah, uh, so, and when I take the stupid courses at the hospitals I work at, I print out my certificates um, or, or save them as PDFs. And you can put them in NeuroTracker. You could put them in NeuroTracker. So a couple of uh, clarifying... Or you could take the AEN patient safety course. Yep, and then you don't have to do it. Then you're good forever. And it's actually a really good course. I, um, I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it a lot more than I most of the enjoy. In fact, I think I'm in Monk Safe Company. I enjoyed it a lot more than any internal training I've ever taken in my current institution. So uh, there's a glowing endorsement for the patient safety course. So here's a question, just to uh, two questions. Um, just to keep me on my toes, 30 articles for the article-based continuing certification every three years. That's right. That if is correct. Primary certificate, if you have two, three, four, uh, you showed us a slide and uh, that same slide is available on the uh, ABPN website that tells us how many articles we would need if we wanted yeah. to keep two or three certificates. Yeah. And then here's another question. Uh, my understanding for the article pathway is that we complete five questions per topic. How much time do we have to complete the 30 article tests? And so I don't know if this question means the OL30 articles or if you're taking a test, uh, how long do you have for that one article's test? So can you just refresh us on how long we have for this? Okay, you can take as long as you want on an individual article. Now you can't back out of the article, you know, once you commit to the exam, you're committed. Uh, but during that time, you can refer back to the article. Um, and, uh, but you, but once you start, 
you're you're not under a deadline for the third article, 30 articles other other than your three year cycle. And we fully expect some people will do all 30 in the last two weeks of the cycle. People being people. And we have had some people, some individuals uh, who said, I'm just going to, I'm going to get all the stinking articles out of the way. And they take some time off, you know, and or, or set aside some time every evening and, and just say, well, I'm going to just plow, plow through them. Uh, oh, I just see a question. Have, have is it possible that 2020 deadlines for sleep and palliative medicine have not been extended for, for, through 2022? Uh, that is not our decision. That's the administrative board. That's the American Board of Internal Medicine. So there are a couple questions above that, Clay, about sort of uh, the alignment of um, the article-based program for primary certificate with subspecialty. And I, in two examples, what if, um, and I think most of us fall into this, where the deadline for our primary certificate is a different deadline for our subspecialty certificate. And then the second is, uh, what about people who participated in the pilot who need to recertify for their uh, subspecialty certificates? Okay, this, this is a great question. And it's one that's making a lot of us pull our hair out. Our goal, our goal is to get everybody's uh, uh, cycles as synchronized as we can, each individual's cycle, so that you're not having to deal with this, you know, oh, I'm in second cycle for primary certification and first cycle for my so subspecialty. And so that will mean that there may be some, I don't know, uh, lapses, if you will. Those are the kind of things that, uh, that uh, uh, frankly, we're still working on, but we'll be communicating with the, the diplomat so that we can uh, get you as synchronized as an individual as we can. Um, so here's another Tess Gordon's math question. I completed all 30 articles in 2020. Uh, so someone involved in the pilot do I need to do another 30 starting in 2021 or after December 31st, 2022? I mean, presumably the answer to this is it depends on when your, uh, when your certificate date is, but can you answer that question, Clay? Uh, I'm gonna to have to answer it by saying, we'll let them know as individuals. That's, that's uh, uh, they just shoot us a question. Also, Patty will be, uh, communicating, as I indicated, in the next few weeks to months. Well, I think we are um, we are out of time. I'm getting multi multimodal communication from our academy staff that we're at, at the hour. So um, I want to thank you, Clay, for uh, doing this with me. I really want to thank our amazing academy staff and ABPN staff. I do want to reiterate a couple of things that you said that the ABPN is uh, ready and able to answer emails and uh, will be very responsive in doing so. That all of the questions that were submitted ahead of time uh, for this uh, webinar uh, have been captured by the ABPN and are being um, pulled together in a uh, informal FAQ of sorts that I'm told should be available later this summer. That, so if you've submitted a question ahead of time, uh, if you need an answer now, send an email, uh, but uh, all of your answers will be forthcoming in that um, FAQ document. Um, and Clay, any, any pa passing uh, final words? No, I, I want to thank you. It's to do this with you. It's my last time doing it with you, so I want to thank you. You always oh, do a great job of this. Yeah. Well, this will probably be my last time doing it, too. I'm rotating off the board, and uh, uh, but I, I would also suggest uh, that we capture all the questions from today's participants, see those that we can add to the FAQ. Uh, uh, right now, our FAQ is kind of an informal Word document, but it will uh, be posted on the 
ABPN folios, uh, again, within a few weeks to months.